I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast, and over here next to me is Father Stephen McKenna, a very good friend of the show. We always love having him on, and today we're continuing a series about courtship. We had part one go up now maybe two weeks ago already, and today we're going to continue that uh, two-part series, uh, kind of a three-part series. We actually have a third part that will come out also maybe next week, um, talking more about platonic relationships, but today we're going to talk about the more of the moral side of courtship and the things to to you know, steer away from, things to be careful about, and really the you know, just kind of what you have on your mind to have a good, holy, and Catholic courtship. Because, of course, as Catholics, that is what we want. We want to avoid all occasions of sin and to, you know, to, to start our relationships in a good and, and um, Catholic way. So, Father, thank you very much, as always, for coming on. And and I, I don't know where you want to begin, but um, um, let's talk about morality and courtship. All right, excellent. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, I guess the place to begin is actually a correction with, the, with your open, opening statement. Uh oh. <laughs> so uh, it was actually the perfect segue because uh, you said we, we, what we want to do is avoid all occasions of sin, which sounds great, but technically speaking, when it comes to the certain things in life and courtship being one of them, um, it's not actually possible so it is um because we need to understand that courtship includes some aspects of necessary occasion of sin so that's a good distinction to have is to understand when occasion of sin is necessary and when occasion of sin is unnecessary the unnecessary placing ourselves in unnecessary occasion of sin is 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 always dangerous to our souls can be very sinful itself and and uh, and we want to avoid that certain occasions of sin are necessary and must be simply handled must must be dealt with because um and that falls back into the understanding that what is the difference between temptation and sin? Temptation isn't sinful itself. Our Lord was tempted, our, our, and um, and everybody must be tempted. It is through temptation that we that we gain salvation, because it's through temptation that we, um, by persevering through temptation and and uh, performing virtuously, is by the actual means by which we um, not only grow and strengthen our souls, but also um, demonstrate. The actual love that we have for god if everything was easy then we wouldn't actually be able to love god truly because it would be something that is um that you know it's um that would just come naturally whereas doing what is a difficult task is where we should actually prove that reality um when it comes to uh, necessary and unnecessary there are times when occasion of sins are Un, are necessary um, to take place. So, for instance, um, if um, a person was a police officer and a crime took place at, um, at uh, uh, let's say, like a brothel or something like that, and he has to investigate, there are going to be certain aspects to that that are going to be tempting and even strongly tempting. And he has to really fortify himself because his duty towards public safety and and um, and overall solving of, of crime that uh, he has to, to take care of uh, supersedes the, the, the temptation and therefore it becomes what is unnecessary and um, towards other people is necessary for him in that singular instance um or another example would be sometimes that uh you know th that uh well they, well yeah so that's that's a good example i think that that just that just shows that with courtship it's the same thing you have two people it, it's necessary to have courtship in order to gain marriages so if somebody is called to the married state they have to find a potential spouse, get to know that potential spouse, and ensure that they are able to actually love and live with that potential spouse and for the future. And it starts off typically for most people with a natural attraction to each other. You hope that people who are who get married, you know, that we talked about in the last program that 
the physical attraction should never be the be all end all. In fact, it's just one of many contributing factors uh, to something. Um, but but it is usually some sort of contributing factor to get at least the ball rolling in the way of courtship. And then comes the attraction towards one's personality and, and attraction towards their sense of humor. And there's other aspects of those, those attractions that are there too, all of which could easily cause aspects of temptation um, in, a, in a person in interaction. But we recognize that in that, there are certain elements of, of necessary interaction that must take place. For courtship to be successful, so for it to be able to person be able to figure out if this is a potential spouse. The question is, and what we really want to deal with today is, how do you navigate those waters? How do you stay out of, keep it in the realm of necessary temptation, uh, occasion for sin, and out of the unnecessary occasions of sin? How do you strengthen yourself to be able to? Um, deal with those necessary occasions and keep them merely at points of temptation and not crossing over into any kind of entertainment or sinfulness in in that. Um, how do you? How does one go about courtship in a way that is not only avoiding the negative, um, i.e., sin, but also fostering the positive that it is a, 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 um, a situation of uh, personal and spiritual growth for 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 the, the couple involved these are the things that um, that we really want to to, to address today and um, so that's why that's why you're Little little statement was the perfect segue, Kevin, because it actually You're welcome, father. <laughs> opens it up, you know. So it's uh, so it's uh, you know. Um, so let's let's talk about um, uh, uh, we talked about in the first program that you know people who um, are adults but not quite ready to enter into the point of courtship or even are ready to start courting but the principal interactions with uh, per persons of the other sex um, starting off isn't per se courtship, um, starts off in more group settings, right? So we talked about that, that that's a safe environment. It's not um, locked into one person in, in particular. It's not anything overly serious. It's just there's a, there is a recognition of some level of attraction that is there, but, but we're not going to um, really make it um, uh, specific beforehand. Now we move into actual courtship. But now we move out of the, the the there's a recognition of both people that yes we've we've had these sort of group interactions and conversations over time, and we both have this mutual feeling of attraction and and appreciation for each other, and we think that this could be kind of that answer to the prayer that God's calling. Can I ask real quick, Father, before we move into that specific side of it? I, I actually have a. A question that's just coming to mind because I think this is something that I even saw growing up. When, so let's let's get again before that you find someone that you want to court. How important is it as parents to not only guide your children? Let's let's say okay, we're, we're assuming again that the 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 men are following the rules that were set in the previous episode that they should be kind of out of the house, kind of you know, kind of grown up a little more on their own. But the the girls. I'd say likely not, and often cases not. Mm -hmm. How important is it for the parents of the men or the young women to play an active role in this beginning of the courtship? And then I guess also as you get into the into the more detailed versions of it, because I think in, the final question onto that is, do you think the parents should make sure that their children are put in these group settings in order to possibly find a spouse? Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, yes, I do think that the original, the initial part of it is something that, to an extent, um, parents can be consciously involved in. Uh, for instance, but a lot of it sort of. Um, I should say this though. A lot of it sort of comes from um, 
from the natural rate, living a Catholic in, involved Catholic life, not, um, you know, so a lot of these things will happen naturally. Um, if you just live your Catholic faith and live it well. Now, that being said, we understand that a lot of people, especially in today's day and time, you know, live in places that are smaller chapels or missions and things like that. And that's harder to, to uh, and maybe a little bit more active nudging and active role might be, be necessary. But if you lived at a place like here at St. Gertrude's, for instance, where there's so much stuff going on all of the time, just by coming and attending regularly at mass and at devotions and benediction and, you know, parish functions that happen all the time, you, it naturally and means that these people will just end up having a bunch of Catholic friends and that grows and, you know, d discovers different people. And then, you know, at certain points, you know, there's men and women that are all part of the same group and, you know, they're all hanging out and doing, you know, having a card night or doing things outside of church as well as in, like that sort of in these bigger places is um, if you're very active and, and you volunteer to do work and you, and you come to functions and you, and you get to know people and everything that all sort of happens. A lot of it happens organically. Um, in places that are that are more remote, more um, you know, more either smaller chapels or mission type of locations, it's just as important to still take advantage of the spiritual treasures that you have. Don't just make it you know like church this thing that we only think about when we're when we're uh, actually going to mass on a Sunday or something like that. But um, but make it a, a lived aspect so that you you know that there's a natural desire for your children because you've not only taught them their catechism but you've you know followed the liturgical year you've tuned in when you don't have mass to to uh, you know mass and devotions that are available online from various chapels you've uh, you've learned you know about the saints and done like by making religion really part of their lives then it's more and more natural for them to try to seek to find the spouse in those settings and if they don't exist in a setting where it has a um a ready-made population then they will be more inclined to try to find and visit places that do so that's point one but uh, sorry point re real sorry real quick father just a real real yeah. quick comment on that we, we've also found as as my my own family here in, in Germany, we we've really started to when we travel, when we when we book a vacation, we very specifically book it to go somewhere where there's a mass. So so literally, we want to go and find somewhere somewhere new, you know, new people. Um, mm -hmm. to, to obviously, first of all, that we can have mass while we're on vacation, but also so that yeah, we we get to meet new Catholics from around the world, and I think that's something that people can do. So if you, if you have two weeks, three weeks, whatever vacation during the year, then say, hey, okay, I live in the middle of South Dakota, then I'm going to go to Minnesota for, for you know, a Sunday or something. And I think that's something that, again, it's something that I understand. We both understand it's much harder if you're in these little parishes, but it's doable if you really want it to be. Exactly. That's a, that's a very good point. And, and when you do things like that, it opens up also the idea, even when they're younger, like you said, your kids, are, I know, are younger and, um, you know, that, you know, as they get to be um, old enough to do these type of things, you know, by having visited other parishes where there's where there's mass while you're on vacation, yeah, we'll go see these things and we'll also be able to go to mass and meet some other Catholic people. It allows them to, to realize that they're not, which is always a temptation in those small uh, areas that it, that that is they're not just part of some weird small little group. There's other Catholics all over the place, and secondarily, those are people that they can become pen pals with and keep up with, and without having to have to always be visiting them. And now, you know, using modern technology to your advantage, you know, you could do exactly like we are on, you know, talking on Skype and or FaceTime or something like that uh, as well, uh, in addition to writing letters. Although I'm always a fan of people writing letters. I think it's classic and it's and it's good. Uh, good Father's practice. address is uh, <laughs> dot, 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 <laughs> Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah, 4900 Rialto Road, if anybody there wants it is. to Westchester, Ohio. Write him uh, some letters, guys. I, I want yeah. I want Father getting some letters. 
Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm beyond the pen pal stage, I guess, in life. But that's uh, but I appreciate the sentiment, anyways. If you want to send donations, it's the same address, though. You know, like <laughs> win win. <laughs> just... <laughs> um, but uh, no, just kidding. But uh, it's the um, so like that. That's really that's a really a good point, Kevin. That it starts young and has to start young form the foundations in your kids to love the faith, to know the faith, uh, to practice the faith, um, so that when it comes time to choosing a spouse, they're going to want to choose a spouse um, naturally from the from the faith, you know, that it shares the faith, because that's the most important link of uh, marriage. That has to be the very foundation of it, that you have uh, the same faith. And when you get to the age of courtship, you know, um, as an interesting aside, this is something for parents to understand. Um, is um, p- oftentimes things get made of um, like teenage angst and teenage rebellion um, that a lot of people go through, and um, and sometimes that might happen in the teenage later teenage years. Sometimes it happens in the early twenties and and things like that. But it's right around that time where they start to really think about their vocation and courtship and everything like that where people parents oftentimes ask like how do you avoid that teenage rebellion how do you avoid them uh kind of going off the rails a little bit and things and the thing to understand is that you actually can't avoid it it is unavoidable every person growing up is going to go through this phase where they are um you know they that um that they start really craving to do their own thing it's part of growing up because it is the transition from child to adult that you have to be able to obtain that independence now what parents can do is they can facilitate it in a positive direction or or help it go in the in the positive direction but it has to be merely just sort of quietly steered and 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 guided rather than the more restrictive you are or more you try to force something around then the more then that rebellion becomes reflective back on you rather than on something productive um because it's you're not allowing them to have that independent thought you're not allowing them to have make their own decisions and i think that's the hardest part of parenting in general is that people think that raising you know young children and having that constant attention that is necessary is the hardest part no that's the easy part because you know what you have to do you know and you know how to correct kids and you know yeah it can be exhausting but it's easy in terms of application it's a it's a struggle in terms of consistency but it's a but it's a and uh and and uh stamina but it's not a struggle in terms of 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 like in understanding and complexity where things become much more difficult and more complex is when they get older you know where where you know morality becomes more complex in the in the, its application where um liberty gained versus still ensuring that they're protected and and guided you know where is that fine line and i often liken it to if you have a person who's on the top of a cliffside that needs that is necessary for them to the goal is for them to get to the bottom of the cliff and you have them strapped in in a rope and a harness and everything you at the very beginning you hold tight so they they're at the top of the cliff and they can start leaning back out but as time goes on you have to let more and more rope out so they can repel further and further down the mountainside if you hold on tightly all the time they'll never reach the goal and if you let them go completely then they'll fall to their deaths and the same is with children at the beginning you hold tightly to the reins you make the rules you enforce the rules you you know because i said so is a sufficient answer you know and that's and that's um you know it's pretty straightforward but as they get older you have to let out more and more line you know and have more and more instructive points allow them to start even making mistakes or and things like that along the along the way make their own decisions and while you still have a safety net underneath them and obviously don't let them do something absolutely ridiculous but but it's okay that they learn hard lessons and and start to you know to experience those things too because 
it, that is what ultimately keeps them from rebelling against you, the parent, the constrictor, when it comes time for them to to do that um, and allows you to have a little bit more of a guiding force because you let them slowly gain that way. And it's a um, whereas if it's a the, it's, it's so much more more of the tendency to hold on tighter than you when they get older because you're just so used to holding on to them tighter and you don't love them any less uh, and you want to protect them just as much and from a scary world and so it's understandable but it's it is necessary that 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 line be let out and that applies when we come to the point of, of courtship because if you are too overly um scrutinous or too overly um involved you can tend to um affect in a negative way the who they choose for a spouse you know if you're overly critical about um you know that future spouse that, that they might have at one point and you you know you forbid them from courting johnny because you don't like, you know, uh, Johnny's haircut and, you know, he's, he wasn't born traditional Catholic. And so he's a little bit rough around the edges, even though he has a good will and he's trying to learn and he's trying to, to grow in those ways because you've forbidden Susie from courting Johnny who, you know, had the faith and just, you know, wasn't at the exact same level as your as your daughter was and the standards that you held were too tight in that regard now she might turn around and go off with you know spike on a motorcycle with neck tattoos and facial piercings and look like you lost a battle with a tackle box and has no uh no faith whatsoever you know and that's that's what you get as that rebellion you wouldn't let you wouldn't let her choose the Catholic of her own. And so she so she rejected you and everything that went along with you, including the faith. And that's how those things oftentimes happen. At the same time, you don't want to let your, your child be a slug. You don't, you know, you, you know that the like things like the YAG are out there and they're great opportunities. And just because the person might be shy or just because they might be lazy or just because, you know, they might have, uh, well, you know, like I get, you know, a job at, you know, Chick Fil A or something like that, and I gotta I can't take time. No, you tell them, listen, you know, get off your rear end and go, 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 do it. Go, you know, this is it's okay to push them into the right direction to go. Like encourage them, get them out there to to go meet new people, to go, you know, have a good time and do these things in the, those proper environments, like a, a YAG type of situation. But but then then let that sort of operate you know and only if you see something truly that is concerning you know re and i mean really concerning then 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 speak up about it i mean um you know it's you know and have the have it as a conversation don't have it as a like a scolding corrective or like i can't believe you would choose somebody like that or whatever it be you know ask them like hey i noticed that uh that johnny you know his language is kind of kind of rough even when he's around us sometimes he slips up in that way like um you know is is he working on it is is there something that we don't understand are you sure this is you know whatever um you know you know let let them explain let them make the those type of decisions uh you know or if there's something really really concerning bring it to the attention of the priest and let him kind of view it and see He's more objective than you are. You know, that's a that's a big part to the equation is is objectivity. You know, again, it's your child. There's never going to be something good enough for your child if you you know if you think about it because you you know you love them more than anybody else does. And so, um, and so that's you know so it's always hard to meet those standards and it's hard to be objective. Um, so. You know, given it, if you if you have concerns, but you're not sure how how um, necessary, you know, how much you should be concerned, you know, bring it to the attention of the priest and let him kind of observe it and, and think about it. He knows his his people. He knows 
um, you know, whether you should step in and say something or just have somebody down for a little chat or something like that or not. So, um, I think that's always a, a good point. But it's, but yeah, I think largely the involvement is in the beginning and the foundation and the, the laying the good foundation. And then later on is, is trusting that, you know, if they're going and finding a, a Catholic who's trying to live a Catholic life that, you know, the, they're not always going to check off every box on the list, but if the major foundation is that this agreement of, of appreciation of the faith and, and appreciation of trying to be good practicing Catholics and morality, then, you know, let, let kind of let kind of build from there and so i guess yeah build, building for there then father i mean if if johnny and susie want to to have a good courtship uh, i mean i guess well yeah how, how do they go about that what what is the way to have a good moral yeah courting okay so um so first is understanding there has to be the understand the outright understanding on both people's part that you are entering into something that is a working towards marriage so don't pretend so like the the, the idea of modern dating is you we're, we're all to some degree somewhat affected by that just from from media around us and examples of the world and whatever like that remove the ideas of modern dating out of your mind it is not there's nothing redeemable about modern ideas of dating courtship is not meant to be um courtship is is meant to be progressing towards marriage it is meant to to be getting to know the person sufficiently to understand is this the person that i feel is is right and correct for me to marry somebody that i can um that i can both love and that we can overall see we overall see eye to eye on the main important issues and as such it's okay to it's it's good to have real conversations in those courtships, you know. So that's that's an important aspect to it is that is number one understanding that it is a means towards an end. Courtship is moving towards marriage. You're not engaged yet, so you, it's not like you're tied down completely, um, you know. That but that engagement part will come, and then that marriage will eventually come. And so it's okay to start having you know, serious conversations about certain things in life, like we talked about before, you know, discipline and prayer life and, um, you know, where to to live and be able to access the sacraments and, um, you know, what, what type of, you know, future plans for occupation or um, schooling or whatever, those type of things are, you know, the, you deal with them more seriously at uh, the closer you get but you have to get the ball going um, at some point along the way but along with that openness towards this is moving towards marriage is that there has to be this understanding with that that if it's moving towards marriage it's moving towards a sacrament and it's moving towards something that is a is a direct union oh, of the two spouses along to god then we need to be preparing in a in a godly way. You know, we need to be doing things in a way um, that avoids sin uh, and and promotes virtue. So we'll start with the the first part, the avoidance of sin. How to to keep yourselves from from, from falling into sin? Because as we say, this is a necessary occasion for sin you're going to spend time alone together talking point number one would be that you have to ha be communicative about that to each other so if it's unspoken and unaddressed that hey let's be on the same page here we need to make sure we're trying to do this in the most most um, safe and productive way as possible then we have to understand then like having that conversation about things to do and ways to help ensure that are the ways that those things get followed through on in the long run. So number one, have those conversations to start off. All right. Yeah, we're, we're going to start courting. Let's, let's be on the same page about our, our principles and our, and our, and our standards and guy and um, barriers and, and things like that. Number two, is um, 
is ensure that um, that you don't spend time truly uh, alone. Avoid complete alone time. So what do I mean by that? Um, it's to say that you you spend your time just the two you spend time just the two of you so you can talk about serious things and whatnot but you do so in places that are uh i guess you could say semi public in that regard that uh, that you know keep keep you honest in a, that sense so um you you go to a restaurant for instance well that is going to keep things proper because you people can see you 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 know if you're both on the same page as you you've talked you you both want to safeguard virtue you don't want to fall into sin then then you're not l looking at somebody who is nefarious and trying to sabotage that you're merely trying to protect now against weakness human weakness in that regard We've we've cast out the outlier of the person who who is trying to to sabotage the other person's virtue. We're we're now we're dealing with two Catholic people trying to live Catholic courtship. So all right, so we're just we got to do the things that keep us from giving into weakness. And and I think it's important to understand just how weak the human will is when natural drive is is involved. And it is it just a little tiny allowance of liberty can very quickly snowball into into impropriety and so you have to be super careful about these things and one first way is just keeping yourselves out in the open in a way don't spend time don't make it a hard rule we are not going to cross the threshold of the other's house or, or apartment or something like that unless we know that other people are there you know so yeah if you want to if if Johnny wants to go visit Susie and he's going over to the house and the whole family is having dinner, fine, that's fine. But Susie's not going to go to Johnny's apartment and under the guise that we're just going to have dinner and expect that to be that that is improper. That is that is a unnecessary occasion of sin right there. Well, well, and and I, and I think, Father, it's it's something that we 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 know that society, I mean, media especially tells us over and over again as men that you know that you're the notch in the bedpost you know i mean i know it's a crude way to say it but i mean that, that there's this it's a good thing to to <laughs> to to go out with many different women and, and be physical let's say that and and i think it, it even probably gets into our heads and it's like okay you know it, it's okay it's fine you know it's a, but but i think it's 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 so important to remember too that as you said father it's, it's a weakness we're defeating and that's if we defeat it that's yeah. strength that is that's manly like that that is the actual mm -hmm. goal that that's the that's the heroic goal that men can have that yes. it's hard it is as you said it, it wouldn't be heroic if it wasn't hard but if yeah. you do that and if you show the, the the young woman that that is what you want and really want and that, that it's even something you're willing to fight for they're going to love and respect you so much more because they're going to see that you you respect their modesty and in their their innocence and all these different things that, that the world desperately wants us not to value desperately yes. wants us to, to not. And, and we just have to remember that that's heroic to, to, yeah, and to it's, fight these. And, things. and there's a substance to that, that, that is, is immeasurable upfront, but, and only recognized in when it's realized, you know, um, because, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the girl that is wearing skimpy clothing or, you know, that the, the worldling that you pass on the street may be the thing that out of weakness, unfortunately, draws the immediate eye of a, of a man walking by. But in his heart of hearts, he knows that's not the person he wants to bring home to introduce to his parents, you know, and even somebody who's just interested in passing pleasures knows that that's, you know, that that's cheap. That's that's you know that's 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 expendable that's that's fleeting and so that's not the person that they're looking to to like i said bring home to mom it but he, the the good modestly dressed 
feminine woman that is out there that is is, is a, that practices virtue and does so well. That's somebody that he can bring home and know that everybody of the family is going to appreciate and approve of without any question. And that, um, and that there's something that is inherently attractive in that in them. In the same way, in the reverse, that the man who's willing to stand strong against temptation and pressure from colleagues and co-workers and whoever or society around them and uh, and against modern influence and and safeguard uh the the woman's virtue and his own above anything else something that he's willing to sacrifice and stand strong for that's somebody that the woman will be inherently attracted to because because she knows that you know that that is somebody that will will always have their best interest in mind that is somebody that will always be wanting to live up to that role of of man and provider and and example for children and 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 uh and leader and everything like that so it mutually um it is the most substantial and attractive thing and is and is recognized in that and so don't let yourself feel like uh, don't let that influence from the world come in because it just cheapens everything and and undercuts you in the in the long run and also you know reality is that it, you know it also damages your soul and the soul of the other person again you know i think one of the most reflective things about it is that you know courtship is supposed to be that you're entering into a situation where you're trying to 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 you're 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 loving somebody right you love and appreciate this person you you are wanting what's best for them but if that action is to damage their soul then what could be con more contrary to the purpose of courtship than that that's it goes away from the purpose of courtship it goes away from the purpose of marriage everything about the sacrament of matrimony is supposed to be a selfless action that it is supposed to be giving uh, of yourself to the service of of the other and um and when it's based in uh when you have a a ready foundation in just giving into base passions and and instant gratification the, there's nothing more self-serving and um and selfish than that uh, that you're willing to put somebody else's soul in peril just so you can have a, a um so you can take liberties you know like that's you know that's um that's that's um it's really truly selfish and so but it's not to but again you know separating out the person that has that intention we have to realize that nobody is above natural inclination and that those temptations would be very strong so even the best of traditional catholics going into a relationship uh, with the best of intentions we have to re realize just how strong the human drive is towards that towards that end of procreation that it's that that's the way god made us so that we would have children and then that drive is so strong that even if you have all of the best intentions and you really do care about the person, the person's soul and everything, it only takes a moment to to take one step in the wrong direction, really, and that can so quickly snowball out of control, and it's much harder to put the put the brakes on if you let the ball get rolling than it is if you prevent it from moving uh, in the first place. And so that that's really what is we're trying to do with this you know yes we want to let, make sure people know that you have to be um, you know virtuous you have to be you know selfless you have to be um keep that as a regular reminder but also understand that even if you are try to be those things you still have to recognize the the weakness of fallen human nature for what it is and that none of us are above the fray in that if we are careless um you know uh, even you know, a little bit so that's why we we make these these rules and that's why i say don't don't spend time 
outside of public people. Now, you don't have to be in a crowd. Like, you don't have to be in an active restaurant. You could go for a walk down the street or at a park or something like that. And that's perfectly fine because you know that at any given point in time, somebody could see you. You're out in the open. You know, it's sort of like don't let your kids have a, a computer or a television in their room. You know what I mean? If the computer is out in the in the living room where everybody is able to see and they have to get the access code from you, you don't have to w constantly be watching over their shoulder. Just the fact that you could walk by them is enough to make sure that 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 the weak the the temptation towards weakness is avoided to fall down some you know pathway of that. You know, it's the same thing in this. It's you don't have to have people chaperoning you and accompanying you everywhere you go. You just have to keep yourselves honest, you know, it's the uh, and 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 being out in public in some sort of way, go get an ice cream, go to a park, go, go to a museum, go see a show, go, you know, something like that Do you know, it doesn't have to cost any money, you know, go, you know, just just do those things. I remember there's been a couple of couples here that, you know, very involved in the church and things like that. And it was always really edifying because they would spend them all so they were so frequently coming to mass during their courtship that a lot of times they would spend many days and a great portion of their courting time just walking around the grounds of the church, you know, walking the, the path with like the, by the grotto and by the stations and around in the cloister and everything like that, just talking, they're strolling around, they're talking, they're by themselves, the two of them, they'd sit out in the cloister and, and eat lunch and they do these things and they could spend hours doing it. And, you know, nobody is necessarily there even, but they know that there's, you know, almost always clergy on the property somewhere. You're at church, and you're and people can see you. You're just out in the open, and and um and as such, you know, it was just always a really edifying thing to see because, again, they were perfectly content to sit by on the bench by the by the the grotto and look at the pond and just chat about stuff, you know, because. It was safe and it was easy to do and it was and they were already there anyways and so why not and so so it's like you don't have to go and spend a lot of money and do a lot of things you know like creative things or whatever just go for a walk go you know do something you know that's uh, that's that you can where you can talk and where you can have fun and where you can you know do all of those you know various things and um you know it doesn't have to be overly complicated to 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 make that um you know, to keep your on, self honest, it's just not. It's just it's just avoiding those really truly segregated pl places where you, you know something something could potentially happen. So. And and Father, something that I've I've heard, and I, I think maybe the church teaches it that in order to help avoid these types of issues, that you should not also have a very long courtship. Um, and I know yeah. that's that's a common error these days that that you. Yeah, you court and court and court and court, and you know, a couple of years later, I, I want to finish my career or you know, my my education, and and so you're courting for for years, and obviously, again, just just realistically, as you said, if you have that drive to to have children, yeah, it, it just has to get worse. I mean, just just logically, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. It, again, it's it's a means to an end, right? So courtship, yes, yeah, so the church very much condemned prolonged courtships. What that it means in an exact time frame, you know, is probably a little bit more vague and and subjective on certain things. But I, you know, I don't think it unreasonable to think of a a general sort of rule of thumb as being like a six month courtship, right? You have three months of courtship and then three months of engagement after that. And then you get married. If you can't figure out, you know, if you get along with somebody in six months time, well, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like it's, again, you know, we have, it's a modern construct, this idea of these prolonged courtships or these prolonged things because their relationships are so selfish in their, in their, in their, their focus because it's either selfish in the in the way that we talked about before where you're actually just giving into those base passions and and you are notching you know your score as it were um or 
it's selfish in the way of, um, you know, because you're the reason why you have to prolong it so long is that you're afraid something might come up at some point in time, which might cause you to have questions about whether you're going to, you know, break up or not. No, like every relation, every marriage has problems. There's no way around that. You're going to disagree. You're going to get into arguments. You're going to have things where you, the thing is, is that if you love each other and you're not selfish, then you figure out ways to, 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 to work that out and to move on, you know, and to, 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 to come to an agreement, you, 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 you spend, you know, a little bit of time figuring out if this is something that you would be able to do together and then you get married. That's, that's, you know, like this is, you know, there, you're, there is no magical Prince Charming. There is no Cinderella the, you know, people are people. We all have our flaws. We all have our strengths you're going to have them become realized at some point in time. You need to spend enough time together where you get to start to see some of the flaws of the other person. So you can understand that they aren't perfect. When you first start courting somebody, you're going to kind of think that they are perfect, but that's not real. You have to, you have to be able to see and recognize those things and, and realize that it's okay that they have them because everybody does, you know, we all have flaws. Um, but it has to be something that like, okay, their flaws are something that I can, I can live with, you know, and I, and he's going to be working on, on his, I'm going to be working on mine. We're going to work together to help each other out. And, and that's going to be productive, but, but it's not, you know, I'm not looking to have a, like a fixer upper as it were, you know, like the, the you know, the damage you know don't don't want the fruit to be too damaged but at the same time we, we can't expect it to be pristine because nobody is and so so it's the realization that at a certain point if you you know you have to be selfless and looking to the betterment of the of your spouse more so than yourself in order to make a, a um a relationship work this that's why the world is filled with divorces now because People are selfless, selfish, and that's it. That's, you know, it, it becomes, that becomes the reality of it is that it's self-serving and no longer than uh, selfless. Um, and then they look for an easy, easy fix button. And when we think about the world that we live in, we don't do that in other aspects of our life. We spend, as a, as a man, right, you probably spend more time with your colleagues at work than you do your family at home, you know, in, in reality, I mean, cause you got to cut out sleep as not actual time that you, I mean, yeah, you're physically present and everything like that, but, but, you know, as the person who has to go out and work, you're going from, let's just use like the, the, like the eight to five o'clock type of window of the you know average american work day as it were the eight of eight to five nine to five whatever you want to call it that's most of your daytime waking time and then you get commute on either side of that for a lot of people and so you're and then you end up at work with people you haven't chosen to be your office mate or your construction crew guys or whatever nice. that you have yeah, you haven't handpicked these because they're your best friends and like wouldn't it be great to have a, a, a company with all my best friends that I know I'm going to get along with. No, you've gone and worked for a company. There's random people that are there. Most of them don't even share the faith, let alone any kind of semblance of morality or, or appreciation of those things with you. And you figure out a way for day in, day out, for years upon years to be able to coexist with these people despite arguments, despite disagreements, despite thinking they smell bad or that they have bad habits or that they talk about things you don't care about, all for money. But then when it comes down to your family, which is the most, and your vocation, which is the most important part of your life, there we're look, society wants to look for the easy out button instead of working hard to fix the problem and investing yourselves in for the long-term solution and everything and that's why you know courtship has turned into dating these prolonged things that's dating 
courtship is a means to an end. This is a process of moving towards marriage. And, and something I've seen, Father, and I know this is going a little bit off topic, but but a, a reason I've seen um, people delay, and I know this even for myself, is wanting a fairy tale wedding. And I, maybe we don't have to spend too much time on this, but I think it's it's it's, it's really worth commenting on because mm-hmm. because I think that mer- weddings are also blown out of proportion and, and also often, not always, of course, but are given the wrong emphasis when, as you mentioned before, of course, it is a sacrament and it's an incredible yeah. one. That's the most important thing. You're starting a life together. And I think there's this, again, modern mindset of, okay, I have to have a perfect wedding in the perfect venue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And thus, well, I can't get married in six months. You know, There's just no way. I don't have time. I, I got to get all these things done. And I see this really often. Um, what, what would you say to that? Father? And you don't have to comment long on it, but what, what would your, what would be your comment on that? I would say again, that's, that's a selfish mentality to, to have towards it, or I shouldn't say, yeah, selfish and misaligned. I should say those two things. Um, and it comes from, again, from modern influence. Weddings never were like what even we have them now. We, you know, if you go back a hundred years. You know, the things that we have going on now are the types of weddings that were reserved for, like, nobility and royalty. And otherwise, weddings were simple affairs. Um, and be, with the focus completely on the sacrament itself, that's the focus. It has to be on the sacramental aspect of it. I remember Father Chicada talking about how there was a, a tradition in Ireland, you know, 100 50 years ago or something like that. And the tradition was like the couple would get married at the church, you know, they'd have their witnesses and, you know, maybe a couple of other people that would come along or something like that. They get married at the church in, in the morning and then they would go. And I forget it was, I think it was to the, to the parents of the father or the husband and it might have been the bride, but I think it was the parents of the of the husband, and they would pr- cook breakfast for him, mm-hmm. you know, of that for them. And like that was like the kind of like that's how that's how small of an affair it was, you know. It's like we we got married with the necessary people, and then we went and had like a little celebratory thing with with the immediate family, and then we were done. Like then we now we're married, and we and we're off to 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 live a married life. Um, it's not to say that it has to be that small, but at the same time, like this is something that the focus should be on your on your sacrament, on your on, and that's it. We, we sometimes you know we sometimes catch heat here, catch heat, or you know sometimes it's difficult for people here uh, uh, that have, uh, that now most people that come here that are here know how we do things. But people that may have moved here or seen things elsewhere or whatever um, are all, uh, sometimes shocked by the fact that, you know, one of the very first things we tell people um, in their marriage preparation classes is that at St. Gertrude's and St. Hugh and many of our associated missions or anything like that, we limit the the, mar- the wedding party to the best man, the bridesmaid, and we allow up to two other people and that's it. It used to be only one additional person, but now we allow two because it was we had so much pushback over time. But but the very purpose of it is like, no, this is not a place for you to have your extraneous friends all wear the same dress or to to choose to have you know um, you know every sibling all represented up there or something like that. That has nothing to do with the sacrament of marriage. The sacrament, you know, you don't have. When you have a baptism, you don't have a godmother and a godfather and 12, you know, godmother aides or something like that. That that doesn't happen. You just have the two witnesses. And that's the purpose of the, the best man and the, and the maid of honor. They're there to witness the sacrament so that they can attest to it later on if it becomes necessary. And, you know, they're the official witnesses of this sacrament taking place. That's why they come forward and stand over the shoulders. And, yeah, it's an honor to be asked to, to be that witness. But truth be told, they could pick anybody. They could just choose random good Catholic from the, from the pew and say, hey, can you be the witness? And that would be fine. It's not, you know, like that's, that whole entire construct is, is an entirely modern one. 
and and it has nothing to do with the sacrament of marriage. It has everything to do with how can my parade down the aisle look really fancy and special. And when you start doing that, where's the focus? Now it's on, now it's on you. Now it's it's no longer on God. Well, and well, it's and no think, longer and on the sacrament. Exactly right, Father. And thinking about it this way too. I mean, if you're spending all of this time, months and months leading up to your wedding. And so much of it is spent on preparing for your reception or something, you know, preparing for your party at after your wedding, rather than preparing for your lives together when you're, you know, like literally what you're going to spend the rest of your lives together. And I think it, it really is. It's exactly. such a modern error. And I think that it, it's something that I really hope anyone who watches this really truly thinks about it and talks about it with the, with the, you know, the person right. that you're, you're courting, because it's, that's so important to remember it's the sacrament. And then, have a nice little party for those who traveled a long distance. I was a wedding DJ. Okay. I, I know I've seen more weddings than probably anyone other than father, uh, you know, because I, I priests have seen probably more than me, but I've seen a lot of them. And, and honestly, they, they're all kind of the same because people they're, they're there for you. They want to be there for you and witness you get married and then have some nice food. It doesn't matter. Don't spend all your time on that. Spend your time exactly. on getting exactly. ready for I, your marriage. I tell I tell people like two things about uh, what I learned from from the reception for my for my um, ordination. You know, one is stop worrying about what the food is going to be. Nobody's going to remember two days later what you ate. Secondarily, um, stop inviting so many people. You know. As an ordination, it's necessarily a public event. You know, the, a priest being ordained is a public occasion. And so therefore there's there's a reception afterwards and it usually ends up being fairly large because it's like, ah, you know, all these people are here for the ordination. And now you can just go off and have, you know, fellow priests or whatever. But typically, you know, a lot of times that ends up being sort of a public thing and you end up spending money for food and stuff like that. And for my case, being ordained in Massachusetts, it was almost, almost like, you know, like a necessity because, you know, and um, in that room to have it public like that. And I remember afterwards, I met and shook hands with so many people and, you know, and was congratulated by so many people afterwards. And when it was all said and done and the dust settled and everything like that, I remember just thinking, like, I wish I had more time to, where I could have actually sat and had meaningful conversations with my family my immediate family and, and my, my closest friends, you know, mm -hmm. and, and fellow priests instead of distracted by all these people that are, you know, distant, more distant relations, you, you're going to appreciate spending time with the people you really care about far more than you would be having your self distracted and torn in every direction and you know constantly you know having to be on you know you think that it's going to be better to have more people but the more intimate smaller settings are always more meaningful in the long run because you'll actually remember what you did and what and what you talked about and people that you that you were with rather than just being a blur and that's what it turns into is a, is a blur um and um and moreover you know think about all the unnecessary expense for something like that you know, you're supposed to be starting off building a future for yourself and your family. And if the first thing you do is end up dropping thousands of dollars on this lavish reception or whatever, what a waste of money it is in the long run. And I always, and I kind of think about it, you know, I try, I, you know, I don't typically say it, but I oftentimes do think about it. It's like, you know, where, where do your priorities lie when you think about, you know, how much you spend on a, DJ or no, I hope you're not gonna, not going to hurt your business of DJing or something like that. Hurt uh, but what's that? Yeah. It hurt my feelings D a little bit. How much? <laughs> how how much are you spending on your DJ or your caterer or your you know tablecloths and your renting of a venue? And now compare that pri that 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 amount of money that you spent on this to the stipend that you gave to the priest who performed your wedding. <laughs> Good point. And and and. Now tell me where where you you know it's not to say that we're expecting you to not supersede the stipend that you give to us to do to perform a wedding like we we expect it to be you know serving food to you know any more than a you know a couple of people is going to cost more than it's probably going to give in the stipend but you know when you start looking at some of these things extravagantly priced and you know having these huge venues rented and you know all this you know, whatever going on, you know, like, and it's like, you know, what, what you put, you know, a, a 
you know a, a small little tiny bit towards the the priest and he was the he received the the smallest portion you know type of thing it's like it has to make you step back and think like where are my priorities in that regard you know am i putting too much focus and, and time and money into these things than i should be is it so outweighed in that uh, and again it's not something you know i make jokes about money i make jokes about donations i'm you know i'm but i'm i'm never i didn't get in this for any for the money believe believe you me but if you did father uh, but i think but, i think you chose poorly i, I don't think there is yeah very, <laughs> I, very, I haven't heard too many stories of, of rich priests around yeah I mean, that, that's that's for sure but but no sure. I, I think that's so yeah, it makes sense. And, and I think that, as you say, I mean, especially when the priests are also doing, you know, marriage lessons and things that are spending a lot of time with you and, and really building you towards, you know, re your, the, the actual important part of it. I mean, it's such a good point yeah. that, um, that the priorities are just so off. And, and I know we, we've gone way off track, but, but I think I think it's really important. I think these are really important points. Maybe they're not necessarily the morality dealing well, with they, courtship, but but they're they're valuable. They, ha they have to do with, uh, they, they, they are, you're right, they are around the idea of courtship, though. I mean, like, it's stuff that should be, I mean, that, those are things that you will end up discussing in your courtship, right? W who are we going to invite? Who are we going to, you know, how big are we going to make this? What are we going to do for all these things? And it sh should be a conversation of, you know, like, okay, like, let's make a list and then let's, you know, let's see how how many layers out we really realistically want to make this you know do you really want to invite people from your work like who cares you know what i mean you know do you really want to invite you know your third cousin no you know what i mean like you you know grandma and grandpa yeah sure you know your your siblings they probably would want to come too you know but you know like your your best friend or your you know couple of your good mates or something like that you spend some real time with yeah absolutely but um but be careful of wading too deep into this gigantic uh gigantic wedding and and, and you know setting yourself back and having I think we lost father for a second. Good, uh, I think he, did you get a cell phone call there, father? <laughs> I think we got you back. Okay. Yeah, just 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 keep it simple. Keep it, um, you know, keep it straightforward and and keep it, you know, tight knit and uh, and you'll appreciate it so much more um, in that way. And it would be more keeping with the practice, the, the idea of it, the focus being on the sacraments, you know, that it is. This is this is, you know, we have a, the, our entire lives to celebrate our marriage. The day is the day that we celebrate joining ourselves with God first and foremost, and so that's a really important aspect to keep the focus on. Um, and that's not to say you shouldn't have fun. I mean, like you should have fun. You should have yeah, of course. Yeah, you, know, you know, it's it's, but it's but but keep it realistic. You know, keep it keep it uh, moderate. You know, uh, in that way. So back to the ideas of like the actual courtship itself. So yes limiting time for courtship is is an absolute necessity otherwise it becomes modern dating you don't do so which is why we say don't enter in a courtship until you're ready to get married you know that's that because it is only supposed to be a means to an end it's not for a prolonged courtship time uh in any way shape or form because because it's just prolonging that you're, you're turning the necessary occasion for sin into an unnecessary occasion for sin simply by longevity you know it's uh you know you, you start making it into sort of like a russian roulette with virtue and so um then uh, so then moving on from that it's um another aspect to that is um is to um we had no prolonged courtship. We also had no time spent in um, isolated, truly isolated uh, places that could cause uh, uh, dangerous uh, aspects to it. Um, it would be as well, um, then I would shift from that into the positive aspects uh, of it that are going to not only help safeguard your courtship from falling to sin, but also promote it in the way of, of growth and virtue too. Absolutely do pray together to start. If you're going out for dinner, 
there is no reason why you can't start off by saying a rosary together. You know, if you're having a conversation on the phone, there's no reason why you, you I mean, I know a lot of people that will, that will, will pray the, that were, during their courtship, prayed the rosary every single night on the phone together, you know, especially if they're a long distance type of thing. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Even if it's you're not going to do the whole rosary on the phone, but you're you know, but you call each other up in the evening, at least say you know maybe find a common prayer that you're going to say together for, for you know like uh, to like the Holy Family or something like that for courtship or uh, uh, you know say you know don't be afraid to ask exactly what you're looking for you know say prayers for purity to together you know because it keeps it not only are you praying for exactly what you're trying to maintain during that but you're also um keeping it out in the front in front of your own eye that this is something we're working towards for purity is is virtuous you know like that's something that uh um that you you know for that you know working towards that uh, that chastity is is really important so pray directly for it and don't be afraid to pray together for that um like i said you know uh, if you're gonna be going uh, you know to do something and there's mass go to mass first you know to do do acts of actual praying together and if you do that every time if you're constantly praying for virtues especially of chastity and purity and so then but in just in general as well and you're and you starting off and uh, your interactions on that leg you're going to be so much more protected towards those those ends of um of uh of um of, of of keeping yourself out of falling into temptation into sin and then, like i said and actually growing you know um during that time you of courtship you should be investing yourself more in in your the the aspects that you should be going to you should increase the masses that you go to you should increase the prayers that you do you should say novenas you should you know do more spiritual reading and, and things like that why because you're trying to become a better catholic than you are today so that you are in a better position for your future spouse moreover you're trying to provide the atmosphere that inspires them to to continue to grow too and that you're work and you're moving towards something that is a major aspect in your life which is which is uh marriage and so um that is like a very important thing um oh to return back to the to the um to the specifics of morality in terms of avoiding sin what comes up oftentimes as a question is what is allowed in the way of um like signs of affection and things like that in a situation of courtship um and i would um and i think that's a really important question i think if you're going into courtship and you're not asking yourself that question then you're already off to, off to a bad start. You know, it should be a question that you should at least have on your mind to to, to know. And if not know know yourself, then at least then you should be readily. If you don't already know it yourself, and making sure of that that been instilled in you, you should be at least asking the priest that question: uh, What is um, allowed in the way of signs of affection in courtship? Now to answer that kind of uh, as simply as possible there um principle number one there is married and there is not married no matter how close you get to this day until you actually exchange vows you are not married so the things of married people you cannot begin to to dabble into until you are actually married so understanding that there is no oh well now we're engaged so it's like a quasi marriage type of situation that's not reality you're married or you're not married now i will say that th that there is an aspect of we're just courting and we're engaged in terms of being of of 
well, the type of where uh, where that expression may shift a tiny bit, which we'll talk about in a moment, but but substantially, that the line is marriage. That you know the when those vows are exchanged and, and everything is said and done, now now your your mode of of uh, expressing affection um, can change. But before that, really no. So um, so the, you know in in courtship in general you know the general principle should be something that you know again you're not married together so the things that you do should be something that you would be comfortable doing with you know um a, a sibling or a friend you know um in that regard um that uh you know to uh you wouldn't be uncomfortable giving a sibling a hug, you know, a quick, but you know, a chaste hug, um, or a, like, like a kiss on the cheek or something like that. You wouldn't be ashamed to um, to necessarily hold your grandma's hand, you know, or your sibling's hand or something. You know, those things are acceptable. Um, what you see in those, the the way of like, oh, like wedding announcement photographs where people are you know sort of like all cuddled up together that's not appropriate for courtship and unfortunately you see it even amongst really really good trad catholics and i and every time i see them i i kind of cringe inside because it's like that is not appropriate you know that's what the world does you know those those long embraces and those you know uh, you know uh putting you know faces like really close up together as if you're going to passionately kiss or something like that no like that's not appropriate for for catholic courtship that's 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 modern that's the world that's going to lead towards temptation that's going to to be a point of of uh, potential uh, falling into sin, whether um, whether together or, or temp being tempted after the fact or whatever it may be, um, you know, uh, and that's where, like I would say, the shift happens when you get engaged a little bit in the sense that um, you know you could give somebody you know a, like a quick kiss or a, you know. A, um, you know, a, a a little bit of a like a of a squeeze, but it's a, it's a general principle came back to. I remember Bishop Dolan talking about this. Think of the other person person as as a hot surface. If you were to touch them quickly, you could escape being burnt. But as soon as you prolong that embrace or that or that uh, that uh, like kiss if it goes beyond just the simple peck or something like that you're going to burn yourself uh if they were if they were a red hot surface the same is true for the 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 spiritual being of that you know if um if if it's if your if your interaction is a, a physical interaction is a, if a quick one a quick hug a quick you know little kiss and and then to separate you know then you know you're you're your soul will be okay, but if you prolong that in any way, shape, or form that even remotely allows this, the, the begins to allow the passions to start to stir in in the person, then you've then you've already begun to do damage to your to your to your soul. So, so yeah, those those idea those modern, you know, concepts of of these cuddling and, and you know prolonged embracing and holding each other and you whatever that's the world that's not god and um so don't don't entertain or enter into those 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 things that's we don't we're not we're not we're in the world we're not of the world you know and so we have to always remind ourselves of that you know it's not it's not puritanical it's 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 cautionary uh, it's it's honest to recognize. Well, and it, it's one of these things that you, you you know that a priest gives a sermon about modesty in, around this time of the year, right? And of course, you just you are automatically know there are people who are just kind of rolling their eyes and like I can't believe you know it's so old fashioned. It's like well, that that's good, you know. It, 
old fashioned is uh, sometimes clearly the the proper way to be. I mean, I mean, if you think how, how back, okay, this isn't moral. I said, no, I guess it is. I mean, I saw a picture the other day at a beach in I don't know Australia back nineteen, I think nineteen ten. I don't I don't know when it was, and yeah. there was someone who was literally going and measuring the the swimsuits of the women, and if they were at a, they they weren't a certain distance, there would be a fine. Uh, can you yeah. imagine that now, Father? I mean, the, the societal, there was actual societal pressure for modesty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, it'd be wonderful if we could Oof. imagine that today, you know, and that's the thing. It's just, like you say, modesty is another thing that is so, even amongst trad Catholics, even amongst good trad Catholics, is so influenced by the world when you think about it, you know, and everything gets boiled down. I'm so sick and tired of things being boiled down to their, to their, like, barest of of denominators like is it a mortal sin or is it not a mortal sin if that's your if that's your barometer for making decisions you have a terrible line you're never going to grow you're never going to be virtuous in your life if it's if your decision making is based on is it a mortal sin or not you know that's uh, that's one step away from being just you know full-blown world playing really at that point in time and and yeah, we need to know what's mortally sinful or not. But it so often comes up that it's like, well, is it a mortal sin or not? And it's like, don't don't try to worry about just avoiding the worst possible outcome. You know, try to do something productive and good and right. virtuous. And we are the light and, of the world, right? Ex exactly. And that's yeah. you know, it's like, uh, and, you know, and I'll I'll wade into it because I think it is important for courtship too. Like that, you know, understand, you know, the way you. Do you know, like, yeah, you're, you know, I would say this is most especially applicable to, to ladies, you know, in this aspect. It's that you're, you're, you know, um, you've already got the, the guy in the door. You don't have to tr now try to dress to impress, you know, because then you start to be tempted to sacrifice modesty standards you know and that's a that is an easy temptation to fall into and so just be careful against it you know just you, you know he was attracted to you before when you were at church you know and that you were wearing your 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 you know your sunday best and things like that like he was drawn to you then that's why he's courting you it's not because you you don't go and change it now you know he he was attracted to the good version of you, not not the one that's compromised with with the world, and and it's like, um, you know, it gets into that real bugaboo, you know, conversation. As you said, priests should be preaching about modesty, anyways, um, and um, that it comes into that question, like, oh, you know, like ladies wearing pants, and it's and it's like, you know, to, to, you know, the question becomes like, is it mortally sinful for a, a lady to wear slacks again if that's the barometer that we're using it's a bad barometer is it feminine to wear pants no no it's not is it worldly yes yes it is you know you have two options as a as a woman when it comes to pants you have frumpy and ugly or immodest like those are your two options so if you were to wear pants that were to not be sinful per se they're, you know, what are you gonna? You look like you work for like the people's revolution, uh, people's uh, workers' party. You know what I mean? Like, right. like picking rice out in the field in Vietnam or something like that. Like that's <laughs> not the look that you're going for. And so, like th those, are, they don't, they don't look good. And and moreover, that it's contrary to everything that you should be trying to be. You should be trying to imitate Our Lady. You should be trying to be feminine and embrace that as as we 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 think to ourselves oh well you know it's sort of along the way that the world goes but we need to reject the world harder now than we ever have before because it is that willingness to just sort of give into what the world offers that has led us to be morally debauched and corrupted to the point that we are at some point we have to dig our heels in and fight back and that's one of them it's like like no you shouldn't be wearing pants like I, you know and the only reason why you do so is because it's you know it's what the world does and is it a mortal sin no like that's not what we're looking for look to be feminine you know, embrace what your what your what you know the the things that are proper to your sex and 
and and hold fast to them because they're beautiful. You know, I, you know, I'll put it this way to you. You know, is uh, you know, is it possible for a woman to wear pants that are not immodest? Yes, it is. But if if you, Kevin, were to show up in a full length hoop score skirt, could I say that that's immodest? in terms of like sixth and ninth commandment no i couldn't if you had all of the you know up to the neck <laughs> top and everything was loose fitting and it flowed down past your ankles and everything like that but would people think that there was something seriously wrong with you absolutely nope. they would right and because why because it's because it might not be immodest in terms of you know sixth and ninth commandment but it's immodest in terms of the fact that it's out of moderation for what is proper and right to, to, to your sex. And the same thing goes with skirts and dresses for, for women versus pants. It might not be modest in terms of sixth and ninth commandment. I'm, we might not be able to label something as a sin if you're careful enough about the way you do that, something like that. However, is it proper to your, to what is expected and, and right to, to, uh, for that is right for your sex? No, it's not like that's, and that's, we have to, we we have to start holding ourselves to higher standards. We have to stop being so afraid to, to deal with these questions because they might be slightly unpopular or whatever it is. And no, I'm not looking for you to go yell at your grandma who sits, you know, who, uh, you know, outside of church wears, you know, wears, you know, old lady pants or something like that. I'm not, I'm talking to the people who are watching this that are, you know, that are, uh, you know, young and thinking about courtship and thinking about how to compose themselves. No, you know, don't fight against those things. That's that's, you know, the, you sh we shouldn't be telling each other that 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 that's that's right. You know, embrace what is good. If you aren't doing it yet, think of it as a point of oh, this is how I continue to improve. Nobody's being judgmental. Nobody's saying that you're bad or something like that. We're just saying. This growth, this this way of growing and, and, and trying to be stronger and to, to become um, more um, more per, ra raised up in the way of perfection. This is what we do. This is what, well, it, what, it, what we're called to as Catholics. I, I had a really interesting a couple of years ago, and unfortunately on, on a lake. It's, it's another one of those things talking about modesty. You can't really go around water anywhere and, and avoid seeing things. But there were two friends, I, I think two friends, a girl with very short shorts and a girl with a very full dress you know very modest all the way to the feet you know mm -hmm. long sleeves and i i just couldn't help but just think the the girl with the dress was so much more attractive i mean like I mean, even just in the actual sense the actual physical sense was like okay yeah if, if you're i guess if you want to say if you're sexualizing something sure okay short pants but it's like the actual actual attractiveness and actually okay what is actually beautiful not not yes. it, when you know what i mean I, I don't know how to describe it but it, it really it really mm -hmm. came home to me i suppose and obviously i knew this from the beginning but it really struck me that like wow okay there's really a difference and it really shows if, if you go yeah. and wear modest clothes and, and modest clothes that are nice the frumpy yeah. the frumpy dresses are also not a good thing and i think that's yeah. I mean, maybe that's not a show for me and father to talk about but but it's also no. true you need yeah. to look nice as well. You can't just be modest. You also have to dress nicely and have a nice style, etc. cetera. Uh, maybe yeah, something that you can ask Colleen about. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to look like it came off a 1980s couch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Apologies uh, to yeah. anyone who likes that, that, that style, but, but I... <laughs> hey, listen, I'm not, I'm, just, I'm not saying you can't make it out of a 1980s couch. I'm just saying that it, you don't have to feel limited in that way. You know, like it's everybody, their own personal, I am right. not the judge of style. You know, I right. am not, right. I am not here to, to pinpoint one person's preference over another person's preference. But I think what the point you're saying is, is, is a good one. You can be modern without being modernist. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can wear things that are fashionable in the way of skirts and tops and things like that. Um, without sacrificing on principles of, of right. the modesty, you know, like that's, that's the reality to it. And, you know, and that's a, you know, I, uh, again, kind of like getting on the soapbox, it's like, you, you hear people sometimes use 
as an excuse that oh, well it's so hard for to find you know things that are modest anymore you're not really trying you know what i mean like that's that's the reality to it is that that's your excuse because if you look at it it's become very much in vogue for ladies to wear sundresses again you know what i mean and um and even just regular people of the world very lightweight blowing down to the to the you know like you can find them out there you you know you can find you know it's you know we're you know i there's 400 people here at st gertrude's half of which presumably are women of various shapes and sizes we can't corner the entire market on jean skirts or <laughs> sundresses or you know not you know, like nice clothing or you know that is modest and like this just like well it would be available but if it wasn't for that like that darn traditional church and like you know there or, or you know like it's it's not like you know it sucks up the entire market they're out there you just have to be willing to try to find them you know just like like general like guys like you know again because women aren't alone on this just because pants are the appropriate thing for for guys to wear guess what skinny jeans or those tight pants or whatever those are not like you know that first off you look like a doofus but second off it's really immodest you know like if it's if it's tight then it's not right you know like it's it's you know it's i'm not saying again i'm not trying to pick on fashion or something like that you know or you know all of a sudden you start realizing like short shorts are for guys are coming back into style again it's like you know we didn't need them halfway down to the shins we don't also need them halfway up the thigh again. We know like the, the Magnum PI look doesn't have to return, you know, like that's, that's not, that's not, you know, great either. And I think it's just, um, of course I dated myself with that, but it's (laughs) so, um, but it's true. It's, uh, you know, just find the balance between it all. And, you know, you can look fashionable and look good. You know, there are certain aspects of things that just look timeless. And and, well, and, 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 and here's here's what my wife and I found, Father. And this is, this is, I think, a more European mindset or German rather than American, I suppose. But the idea being that you don't need to have a wardrobe full of clothes. You can just have a Sunday best and then, you know, some other stuff to work in or, or whatever. You don't need a million pairs of clothes. And I think that's another, it's another, it's, it's the consumerism that, that we have, that we, we have to have the, you know, this that matches this. No, get a couple nice yeah. things, spend a lot of money on three dresses. Men spend a lot of money. I spent a ton of money on a suit coat and you know what? Yeah. I wear it every time I go to church, I wear it at every big event. I have one suit coat and I hope I'm going to have it for the next 10 years. I invested in it. It was a lot of money and it's scary. I totally understand that. You see, it's like, and it is, it's hundreds. It's, it's a lot, but it is awesome. It looks good all the time. And I don't have to pick my clothes. I'm like, boom, there's my suit coat. Exactly. It's beautiful. There you go. And it's, and it's, and again, and then you hit on another point there. I mean, we were getting a little away from the, from the (laughs) courtship, but it's like, but it's, but it's true. Like, again, if you were talking about like modesty in men, like, guess what, gentlemen, you know, we're, you know, wearing a polo shirt and a pair of pants to, to mass on a Wednesday, that's fine. Wearing a polo shirt and a pair of pants to a mass on a Sunday, that's not fine. That's not okay. You, you should have a shirt and a tie and a suit jacket all on for your Sunday mass attendance. Uh, and, you know, there should be no excuse for that. I know people who are poorer than poor that have been able to go to goodwill or to uh, you know you know wherever and be very frugal about it and like you say get a suit coat you know if i think there's any you know if any priest out there who's worth investing your soul into if you came to him and honestly could not afford to get a suit coat and a tie he would pull out his wallet and give you the money to do so He'd also pull, open up his mouth and tell you to stop begging for money if you could be a little bit more fiscally responsible and do it yourself. But if he knew that you were really just down on your luck and poor and you didn't have a suit coat and you know you're trying to find something but you just can't afford anything, he that is something that would be 
worthwhile is for him to give you forty dollars to go down to Goodwill to pick up a, a suit coat for for mass, like and a tie. You, you know, it's like it doesn't take that much to have proper attire for a Sunday mass. But you said you could have one pair of like dress slacks, dress shirt, tie, suit coat. If that's the only set that you own and you but it's just to ensure that you get to mass on Sunday properly dressed as a as a gentleman, then you're you've done your duty, you know. If you have more means and you have more, you know, able to ability to do more than that, great, you know, fantastic. But but to to get one, you know, one set of proper Sunday best clothes, you know, it's not too much to ask, you know. And again, in, in our modern world, with most people, look at I could probably look at your your day to day activities and say, you know what, you don't go to Starbucks for two weeks and you can go get yourself a suit coat, you know, like right. that's at, at, at Best Buy, you know, at Best uh, uh, Goodwill or something like that, or, you know, discount store or something. And so, you know, my father hasn't, father hard. hasn't had to buy a suit coat in a while. He's telling you to get it at Best Buy. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. I, I have to buy suit coats. I have, I, oh, I guess that's, that's fair. Uh, that's true. Uh, apologies. That's right. I, I got to remember yeah. that. You don't, you don't always wear a cassock. Fair enough. That's that's true, yeah. So I have to buy, I have to buy. You know, I'm I'm living off mass stipends, people, and I still get go out and get a suit coat and there you go. and pants yeah. and and everything like that. So you know, that's you know, it's it's doable. So it's um, well, it's, well, and it's I, worth it. Uh, sorry, father, and, and I think you're you're totally right. I think it's it's the putting the effort in, in first and we're talking about courtship and that's the the original topic we've kind of gone over the place today which i always appreciate with you father um <laughs> we, i mean we, we always talk about such interesting topics but but i think that you know if you if you put that effort into it and you really try to look good i mean i and groom yourself i mean cut your hair you know shave your beard i mean look look good first of all for mass because well mm-hmm. it's for god it's the, it's the most yeah. important thing we can ever do in our lives is go go to church and, and actually witness the holy sacrifice of the mass. But then you do have side effects from that too. I mean, if you're looking for a Catholic girl and a Catholic girl walks into the church, just happens to be that one day, or let's, let's say in the vestibule, let's say not in the, the church itself, but you know, and she sees you and, and you look like a bum. Well, what do you think your chances are of, of attracting her? I mean, and, and same yeah. for the girls too, of course. But I mean, for, for, for guys, I think, Hey, really, really put yeah, it as, as a high priority, really do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I mean, they, they used to talk about how like really poor people back in the day before running water and stuff like that, they would have their, their weekly bath would be Saturday. Yeah. So that they'd be ready to go for Sunday morning. You know, that's, that's when they would be able to, to, to go heat up the water, fill up the tub, do the, you know, all those type of things. And it would be on a Saturday to, to be ready for Sunday, um, you know, or, but it's like you said, it's just, um, Every aspect to it is, you know, a, l- a little bit of effort goes a long way in, in, in everything. And if you take care of the little things, then you take care of the bigger things. You know, it's, uh, you know, that's why, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, you know, and, and um, because it's the, you know, they all sort of link together. You're, you're, a person can tell like you have your life together because you take care of those little things. It's not to say to be vain. People can tell that too, you know, vanity sticks out as, you know, as, as, as well. But if it's, but to, to somebody that takes care of the particulars is not afraid to, 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 to be, you know, like you said, well put together and everything like that. It says a lot about, it. I remember when I was in business, you know, it's like one of those weird things that I, you know, as a, as a commercial property manager that I would notice, regularly like of things about people and you subconsciously make judgments of it like are their shoes shined you know are do, do they wear a watch you know do they do they you know um is their tie straight is there you know like those type of things and in interactions where you don't even think about it and but it's but it's true like if they if they're supposed to be a, a business professional meeting me as a business professional and they come in and their shoes are all mud caked and everything like that and and dirty and scuffed it's like well you know do you do you start to wonder like you know is this the lawyer that i want to be talking to or is do i want to be talking to the lawyer that that has this self squared away 
And again, it's subconscious. I remember we had to, when I started working as a, as a commercial property manager, we were not allowed to have facial hair. I had a, I, from the time I was in high school, like all the way through high school, you know, all the way through college, everything, I always had a goatee and, or some sort of facial hair. Um, and when I became a commercial property manager, part of the deal was I had to shave and be clean shaven because they had, I mean, it was a multi-billion dollar company and they had studies that, you know, that, um, where sub people subconsciously trusted people with facial hair less than they did people without. And so it was like, like, but it's just, again, I don't think, you know, I live vicariously through other people's beards. Actually. I love, <laughs> I, I wish I could grow a beard, Me now. Too. but, uh, but, um, uh, but it's, but it's the, um, it's not to, to, so I'm not poo-pooing beards, but it's just to say that those little aspects of, of just taking care of yourself do play it, it, if not in the conscious thought in the subconscious thought of, of human beings. And so, you know, try to, try to do your best, you know, it's no, again, don't be vain. Don't be, don't be obsessive, but, but just, just, just be, you know, be, you know, conscious of it. And, and it, like you said, you'll be, you know, you'll be more apt to, to, to find that person you're looking for because they'll be, they'll see that and, it'll be an indicator of other things in your life that are hopefully put together as well. Well, well, and I, I say going back to dressing nicely for mass, I mean, I, I, I tend to say, okay, if, if you're going to, you, you know, you're going to, let's say England and you're going to have a um, afternoon tea with a King, mm -hmm. you, you go, you're going to go in a polo shirt, you know, are you going to go in scuffed shoes? I, I mean, I mean, I mean, and then compare that to you're, you're literally going to church with God. That yeah. God is coming down onto the altar. God, the King of Kings. This, this isn't. I mean, and I think that that's a, it's a whole different topic, I suppose. But but I think that that's yeah, just would, that would, mentality. We got to get back to. It. Would you Would you show up to a wedding in a hoodie? You know what I mean, like, no, exactly. you wouldn't. Exactly. Of course, you yeah. wouldn't. And so, why would you show up to 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 Sunday mass in a in a hoodie? And again, you know, weekday masses are totally we are different. We understand that people are going to work and people are going to you know, out to run errands afterwards. And, you know, you, you're not always able to be able to put on suit or whatever the, you know, the, we'd much rather you come to your, to an additional master in the weekend, you know, in your coming from the construction site in your work clothes or something like that, than not show up at all, you know, and let the, let the better be the enemy of the good. You know, we don't want that, but on a Sunday, you know, you should be able to, to, to square yourself away. You know, if that's, that's that's uh that's different and so that's um so you know that's what would you know what we would be expected you know you wouldn't you know you wouldn't expect your priest to show up there with half half the vestments on or like wrinkled dirty vestments or anything like that you know it's i mean it might be it might be end up that way if he's on like stop number seven of a mission run where you know and tsa has like manhandled his baggage or you know baggage claim people have thrown it off the off from the from the top of the plane down to the tarmac or whatever it is but but in general like if you're showing up to a church or whatever you expect it to be you know put together and to, and to have you know decent things these things are for god you know so you know you don't cheap out on the things for god that's you know that's bavaria is a where you live is a perfect example of that kevin uh, it's always so striking to me right what do you end up having there you have these monasteries that are there that were benedictine monasteries right mm -hmm. these people had vows of poverty they right. owned nothing at the end of the day at the end of the year they would return the very habit off their back to be reissued a, a new ha a, a different habit because even the very idea of possessing their own habit for too long could constitute ownership in their mind and they wanted to disavow themselves of that completely but then you walk into the church and what is it it's gilt and gold some of the finest artwork from some of the finest craftsmen and art artisans all throughout the church imported marble and you know just beautiful beyond compare and then you find like the chalices are just these gorgeous you know uh, 
are, you know, magnificent works of art that are gilt in the, the in precious metals and gems and everything. Because they weren't spending money on themselves, those are all for the service of God. The vestments of European vestments, you know, like how many, you know, like how magnificent they are, and just how doing extraordinary, beautiful it all is. It's because the money that money is spent on God, and the things for themselves. That's where they denied themselves, not on the things for God, but on the things for them, the, their personal aspects. All right, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll. Uh, you know, re-suture my sandals so it's that, you know, holds together for a few more months rather than, you know, like going to, to ask the community to purchase another pair of sandals for me. But, but you know, but the things that were had to do with the divine service, those things were impeccable and, and perfect and, and of the highest quality and standard. And the same thing goes for us in terms of um, application as to our own dress and comportment when it comes to, to our Sunday mass and our Sunday best and, and everything too. And so, Father, to bring it back to, I, I, I suppose to wrap up the the topic, um, we, we've gone an hour forty already. Either either those who've stuck <laughs> with us, those those who've stuck with us to this point, you guys are 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 true heroes. But I might cut this into two. We'll we'll see because it, it's gone pretty long. But but Father, um, yeah, what do you want to wrap it up with? Do you have any more points you wanted to say, or do you want to just kind of to you know put a bow no. on it? No, I think. Uh, I th I think that pretty well covers it. You know, I think um, if you're prayerful, you're, you're careful to avoid easy occasions to, to fall into sin. You, you're trying to do things the way the church wants them to be done. Um, but, you know, the ways that we kind of laid out with, uh, um, you know, some of these things. Um, you know, if you have the best, if your number one focus is on the well-being of the other person's soul, and that's your guiding principle, then, you know, courtship is a very holy thing and it leads to a wonderful sacrament and, um, and it's a, and it's waters that everybody has to navigate or most people have to navigate at some point in time. Don't think of the ways of the world, think of the ways of, of God and, and the ways of holy courtship and, and do it that way. And, and, and you have a good courtship, it sets you up for, for holy marriage. And that's, uh, it's, it's like an investment, you know, so, Perfect. Father, thank you very much. Um, as always, I greatly, greatly enjoyed the conversation with you. I hope everyone else did as well. Um, we hope to have Father back on. I'm sure we'll, we'll have him back on for various topics. If you have any questions for Father um, that you'd like him to talk about, I mean, if it's a you know moral issue or, or courtship or, or whatever, I think Father is open to, to hearing these questions and coming on with me to talk about them. So please email me, kevin89davis at gmail.com. Um, again, ask me what you would like Father to to speak on. We can never guarantee when it's going to be. He is a busy priest, of course. Um, could be months from now, could be years, I suppose. <laughs> but but hopefully we'll get to Father. And and, and and if it's a if it's a worthwhile topic, um, I think Father would hopefully be willing to to um, answer your questions and to to talk about um, whatever topics are coming up. Because because that's something that I think Father and I both appreciate that there are things that. You know, if, if if I sit down and Father sits down, and we think, okay, what can we talk about? It's actually kind of hard. So oftentimes these things come up when someone else is, hey, this came up in my life. This was an issue, and then it it leads to a very good podcast. So it helps me out, and Father can help us out as well in giving us a good um response. Yeah, I mean, what this 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 show originated from a from a joke made on a on a Facebook page, right? Right. So, I mean, exactly. So I mean, it's, all it takes is a little bit of inspiration, and and we have this. There's a myriad of of moral and questions and you know and uh, and things like that that are we know that are out there that are applicable to your daily life and that's you know and that's what we want to do is just is help guide and instruct and and, and keep you um you know learning in, in those things so perfect bother well and, and we'll also have a third part coming up about platonic relationships i'll publish that sometime after this one father thank you so much for coming on we hope to see you again sometime soon and until then god bless you god bless you too thanks kevin